Hey, I saw this article in the Wall Street Journal, particularly the part over here where it tells about the uh, change in the top spot of uh, the tr one trillion dollar club. And what it's basically highlighting is that uh, Microsoft passed um, Apple as the largest capitalized company uh, in the world. And, and I got to thinking, um, who was the largest capitalized company 10 years ago? And 10 years before that, and 10 years before that. <clears throat> and so I did a little research because I, my, my end objective is if Microsoft's the top company and it's followed by Apple, Amazon, and Alphabet, who's it gonna be in 2030? And what is going to change to make whoever it is, the, the top company. Because I think it's important, I, I watch Squawk Box and um, I see these talking heads talking about investing and they're always talking about investing based on tomorrow. What the market did today, what's it gonna do tomorrow? Um, and that's not smart investing, that's, that's blackjack gambling. Um, and so I thought, okay, let's do a little study and see what happened. Well, first of all, what drives our, our stock market, uh, our economy? And, and I think it comes down to two things. Well, number one, the consumer. You, the consumer, um, are, are the purchaser of products and services, and those products and services are monetized to make the companies offering them money. Um, and so the other thing is demographics. If you can understand the demographics of the country and how we're moving through it at various times, you can be, put some predictability in, into the stock market. And so I did the study and here is a, a look at it. Okay, one other thing I wanna talk to you about before we get too deep into uh, where you should invest your money, is the race I'm in. I'm in a race to get one million subscribers on my YouTube channel. Now there are, I believe it's something like 31 million YouTube channels and 1,600 of them have a million subscribers. Now most of those people have been involved in YouTube for over 10, 15 years. I don't have 10 or 15 years, so my race has to be involved. So I'm asking you, if you haven't sub subscribed to my channel, please, hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, and help me get more, help the algorithm on YouTube. Then if you are subscribed already, get your grandmother subscribed to the station or your parents or your children, because I think the things I'm gonna be telling you, whether it be about real estate or investing, are gonna be beneficial. So do that for me and I'll keep sharing my knowledge with you. Okay, now let's get on to the subject at hand. Uh, I started with 1980. Um, and I think you'll see in 1980, it was basically our economy was driven by oil and automobiles. Uh, at this point, the boomers were uh, age 16 to 34. So the boomers were buying their first cars. They were probably used cars but nonetheless, they were buying their cars. Their, their parents, on the other hand, were approaching their peak earning years. And, and I know that for years, uh, our family had one car. Um, then all of a sudden, we had two cars in the garage. And as my brother and I uh, passed our 16th birthday, we had one in the driveway as well. So we had three cars. So. It's understandable uh, at, at 1980, and what I'm looking at is January of 1980, who were the largest companies? Um, and as I say, you can see that they're driven by oil and um, with uh, companies like uh, General Motors um, and Ford, those are the auto, auto Texaco, Chevron, Golf, um, General Electric, I think that's probably there because uh, my parents were, were buying appliances, and Amoco, another oil company. Then we go one uh, decade ahead to uh, 1990. 
And here again, we see that some of the companies from 1980 moved forward, such as General Motors, Ford, Exxon. Uh, IBM was uh, a, yes, that was a move forward. General Electric, uh, Mobile, and Texaco. The newcomers were Chrysler, uh, DuPont, and Ultra. Ultra is, was Philip Morris, it's a tobacco company. If you watch any movies from the 90s, you see that everybody smokes. Um, so again, it was driven by automobiles and oil, for the most part. Then we jump ahead to 2000. Again, General Electric moves to the top. Um, Cisco is the first appearance. That's, uh, uh, of course, the advancement of the, the computer industry. And then we have Exxon. Pfizer, well, the only thing I can think about for Pfizer was Viagra. And then Microsoft makes its first appearance, as does Walmart, Citigroup, um, Vodafone, I don't know what happened to them. Intel, again, technology, and again, some, some oil. At this point in uh, 2000, the, uh, the boomers are 36 to 54 years old and Generation X is 15 to 36. So that's probably, um, as I say, we're moving into the first of, of the technology era. And then we go to 2010. Still, oil is a big part of it. Um, and, and we first see our first entrance of China, and it's again, it's in the form of oil. Um, Microsoft uh, stays, uh, stays in it, has moved forward, as has Royal Dutch, and new to it is AT&T. I suspect this is the start of AT&T's bundling of services. They're getting into the TV business, as well as um, G4 into the, uh, the uh, handling of the phone business, and then Procter & Gamble. Um, which is a, a consumer products. Um, and again, in 2010, our boomers are now 46 to 64, and Generation X is, um, is 25 to uh, 46. So we have an aging of the population as we go into 2020. Uh, and as you can see, between 2010 and 2020, only one company that was one of the largest in 2010 moves forward, and that's Microsoft. Microsoft has been battling with Amazon and Apple for the largest companies, but still, Microsoft is, is in that leading pack. But the rest of it, as you can see, is pretty much technology, and financial, except for Berkshire Hathaway. What I want to point out here is the entrance of uh, Alibaba and Tencent. Alibaba is China's version of Amazon, and Tencent is really a conglomerate. It's, it's everything from Facebook to, um, to PayPal to... Um, uh, it, it, it's involved in just making life easy for Chinese people through the use of their phones. Um, and then we, hit, we see Visa and J.P. Morgan Chase. And that's kind of interesting because these are, these are the financial companies. And if you saw my last video, you know that I, I'm not too high on the current maneuvers of financial companies. I think they are setting us up for a market correction through the loose use of credit and uh, making our lives potentially disastrous. Um, at this point, the boomers are 56 to 74 years old. Generation X is 35 to 56. And the millennials are just entering the scene age 24 to 34. I suspect that with this 20, uh, 14 to 34 and credit with Visa and J.P. Morgan, 
that explained is explained by the entrance of um, and and the purchasing power of of the millennials and the, their use of credit. So I think that's what that is all about. So what I what I'm trying to show you here is that our economy is being driven by the consumer and by m watching the consumer's demographics. As we go into 2030, or as we go into 2021 and, and on, what's gonna, what's gonna create the companies of the future a of 10 years from now? And, and I think when you go back to the past, it's demographics and it's the consumer. Well, the first thing you need to recognize is that the United States, as you can see, has dominated this large company category for the last 50 years, but now China's coming into the picture. And our population is 300 million, and China's is 1.3 billion. And right behind China, is India, and India is 1.2 billion. Between China and India, they represent 36% of the world's population. So they represent 36% of the world's consumers. So you have to take them into consideration as what's going to happen. So with that in mind, I, I, I did some guesswork and I said, okay, who are going to be the largest companies in 2030? And as you can see, I'm suggesting that number one is going to be Alibaba, uh, number two is gonna be Tencent, number three will be Baidu. Um, Baidu is very, very heavily into artificial intelligence and it would be the Google or Alphabet of, uh, of, of the United States. I then put in three more companies, um, Amazon, uh, Alphabet, Google, and Microsoft. I don't know that they will be in that order. I suspect there might be somebody, but I think they'll be in, in the top 10. The rest of the top 10 is going to be driven by China and India. Um, artificial intelligence, machine learning, big data, and auto autonomous automobiles. At this point, I wanna, I wanna ask you to do yourself a favor and go down into the description and find the book um, link that I have put in there to uh, The Big Nine, written by Amy Webb. This is going to give you her take on the nine biggest companies, and they are some of those that I have just listed as the 2030s, um, and how they're going to be driven by artificial intelligence and mach machine learning, and how she thinks, and she's a futurist, and I, I, I really think she's good at what she does, and how they're gonna change your life. So I want you to read, read that. And then the second book that I want you to consider is entitled um, The Disunited Nations, The Scramble for Power in an Ungoverned World by Peter Zeon. Peter's also the author of the book of the Accidental Superpower, which I've been recommending for, for months now. But this new book is probably going to be more current and it, it'll be available March the 3rd. It's also in my list of suggested readings. If you would, um, click on the link that I have. That'll give me a little bit of uh, Amazon affiliate marketing money, and I'd appreciate it. So then the next subject that I really have been pondering is that of autonomous automobiles. Because I, I looked at this of the 80s and the 90s and the dominance of General Motors and Ford Motor and, and the oil companies. And so I'm saying the automobile is still going to be around, it's just going to be different and it will be a major part of our economy. So how is it going to be different? Well, we know what Tesla is. It's a, an upscale um, 
uh, electric automobile that is already uh, getting into the autonomous field, which will expand dramatically over the next three to five years as 5G becomes more prevalent. So I, I got to thinking, okay, how is this going to affect my life? And how would they, how, how would I get involved with an, an autonomous automobile? Well, I think, first of all, the government is going to be give me an incentive to get rid of my internal combustion engine uh, for two reasons. One, it's a pollutant, and number two, it's dangerous. 95% of all accidents occur on, on the highway are occurred by uh, driver air. So if they can get me out from behind the driver's seat, uh, a whole lot more of us are going to live. Um, so I think there'll be incentives to get me out of my car. The other thing that I think is going to happen is my wife has a car that we don't make any payments on it. In fact, I think she brags to me it's about 15 years old. She only drives about 6,000 miles um, a year. Yet that car cost us in um, license plates, in uh, maintenance, in gasoline consumption. Uh, it's not a real efficient automobile, it's a Porsche. Um, and um, insurance. So I got to figuring that that car cost us somewhere in the neighborhood of $4,000 a year. And she only drives 6,000 miles. Well, what if Uber had a program that I could sign up for based on miles that maybe I paid $250 a month and through the use of a device, and I don't think it's gonna be my phone, I would let, or she would let them know that she needed to go to the grocery store and go by the bank and go have coffee and lunch with her friends and, and do that. And she would schedule a time and when she walked out the door, a, a, an autonomous automobile would be there to pick her up and take her on her errands and then bring her home. Um, and then when she and I went out and we were just going somewhere in the city, we'd also use that system. And so maybe it cost us $200, $250 a month. That would save us a lot of money relative to keeping that Porsche on the road. And I think that's going to happen. So in my companies of the top 10, I'm, I'm, I'm going to put in an, uh, an, an autonomous automobile derivative. And I don't know if it will, be, I don't think it's going to be the manufacturer. It's like I preach that you don't look at who builds the infrastructure, you look at who monetizes the infrastructure. Who can get a monthly check from me that will pay for a service that I will look upon as a benefit? And I think I think a one, one car in every garage is, is in our future. Uh, I think that other car, right now that second car is a BMW, um, the internal combustion engine, uh, that's about, uh, let's see, about five years old. Somewhere in the next four years, I suspect I will buy some form of electric automobile that has at least a range of 600 miles on it. So that would be maybe my work car, in our travel car. But I think for my commute within the city that isn't work related, just shopping or dining or meeting folks, is going to be an autonomous vehicle. So I believe those are the companies of the future. And I believe that that's what you need to be looking to invest in is, and, and let me throw this in. I also believe there is going to be a major correction in the, in the market between now and, and 2030. In fact, I believe it'll be uh, between now and 2021. Uh, I think uh, there's a lot of people who have a motivation to keep the market uh, going up with this being an election year. Um, and, and it seems that the uh, Treasury Secretary and the head of the Fed Reserve is on his team and they're doing all they can to keep 
liquidity in this market. And when I say that, I think I, you need to understand that the Fed is pumping billions of dollars into the market on a, on a regular basis. That money is being grabbed up by hedge funds and being invested. And what, what a hedge fund does is take the money that he gets from the Fed and he leverages it up 10 to 1 and goes into the market and buys stocks on a quantum basis, meaning they're buying and selling by the second. And then they liquidate at the end of the day and give the money back to the Fed through the repro program. So it's, it's when I say that the Fed and, and, and the, the Treasury and the government has financed the run up in the market, that's exactly what I mean on a daily basis. They're pumping money into the market, putting it in the hands of, of the uh, hedge funds who do 85% of the trades every day, and they're just pushing this thing higher until that comes to an end. And, and what's going to bring that to an end is another banking crisis. Uh, for some reason, and it could be China, their markets fail in lieu of the, the other problems they got going on right now. Um, you could see the toilet flush in, in China. Uh, China no longer is buying our treasuries, no longer is buying our debt, and this whole thing tumbles. But it will tumble. And so my direction to you is, when it tumbles, invest for 2030. Take that list I showed you, and that's what you should invest in. And watch this automobile thing. Um, there's going to be a huge opportunity. Somebody is going to get a monthly check from you that's going to give you an incentive to get that one car out of your garage, maybe even two. Uh, because again, let's, let's think of how, in Birmingham, how many people go downtown every day? Why couldn't a van for six people with no driver come down on a regular basis, pick them up, take them in there, let them sit in the car and do their work and, and get the, get, get, stop polluting our country. This is going to happen. And it's going to be, do you want plan A, plan B, or plan C? We've got a car that'll pick you up with no driver, and it's electric, and it's going to make your life better, and it's going to make our world better. This is a done deal. So watch for it and get ready for it.